Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is um, Dr. Maria Pena, and I'm the medical director for the Diabetes Alliance Program at Mount Sinai Hospital. And, and because it's November, which is known uh, for as Diabetes Awareness Month, we will talk, be talking about diabetes, um, how it impacts our health, its complications, and what we can do in order to prevent these complications. So Today, I will go over a brief overview about diabetes and how it affects our health. And later, you will hear from my colleagues specifically how diabetes affects cardiovascular health and eye health. So I always like to tell my patients that diabetes is a disease where there's an excess of glucose or sugar in your bloodstream, and this sugar cannot get into our vital organs. And this free-floating sugar that's floating around in our system can affect circulation. So what organs depend on circulation? Every organ, all of our vital organs. So from head to toe, circulation affects your brain. If there's not appropriate circulation to the brain that can lead to strokes. If there's not enough circulation, healthy circulation to your eyes that can lead to something called retinopathy or bleeding behind the eyes that can eventually lead to blindness. Another major important organ is our heart. Inadequate circulation or pumping to the heart can lead to heart failure, heart attacks, amongst other things. We also have circulation in our intestines. Sometimes if uh, circulation is impaired in your intestinal organs, people can have something called gastroparesis or slowing of their gut motility. And this can lead to digestive issues, amongst other things. Our kidneys, very, very important and depend on circulation. So and circulation can be impaired to the kidneys. This can pre uh, present with protein in the, urine, in the urine. It can present with an elevation in what's called creatinine or a decrease in GFR, which is your glomerular filtration rates. All very important things you need to ask your doctors when you're getting um, evaluated. And lastly, impaired circulation to your lower extremities can lead to something called neuropathy or nerve damage or nerve pain. And this is characterized by tingling, numbness, burning sensation. Sometimes if you lose sensation in your feet, for example, that can lead to amputations down the line. So all of these things sound very, very, very scary. However, it's all very preventable. Of all the diseases out there, diabetes is one of those diseases that you do have control over it. Your day-to-day -day lifestyle can control, um, can be controlled. You can control your glucose levels with your diet, with your physical activity, and with medication compliance. And you are not alone. It's important to understand that you have a team out there for you. Here at Mount Sinai, we have a big team with endocrinologists, internists, specialists, and the Diabetic Alliance Program, which is, consists of certified diabetic educators that can not only help you with medication compliance, but also help you, how can you make a dietary changes that are compatible with your lifestyle, with your culture, give you ideas on physical activity, and also help you with the nuances of medication coverage, understanding instructions, referrals to other specialists as well. So again, this is what diabetes is, especially when, when I say this, this is mostly we're focusing today on diabetes type two. And all of these things can have a, a permanent uh, consequences in your health down the line, especially when we talk about eye disease, kidney disease, and heart disease. But again, these things are preventable with not only diet and exercise and medications, but also choosing the right medications. Fortunately, we now have newer medicines that not only help you with A1C reduction, but also help you with cardiovascular uh, health protection. And we will be talking about that a little later on. In regards to your eye care, it's very, very important to not only take your medications, obviously, to keep your sugars down, but to also have annual screenings. In case something does show up, it can be treated early. Remember, we can prevent, and also by catching things early on, we can treat them before they become uh, more detrimental to our health. With feet, many, many patients are scared about amputation, sores. It's very important to see a podiatrist in order to keep an eye on these things because let's say a person cannot feel their extremities. They cannot feel your feet. Sometimes you don't feel there's a little cut. And by the time you're able to notice it, it's a little bit too late. It has become infected. It's red. It's 
burning, uh, 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 the temperature is higher, there might be an ulcer. And at that point, it gets a little bit more complicated to treat. But I always tell my patients, you need to do daily inspections, not only on the outside, but also in between the toes. It's very important because sometimes things will hide there. And you need a podiatry exam, a foot exam. Every time you see your, your endocrinologist or internal medicine doctor, and at least once or twice a year with a podiatrist, if that's what your internist or endocrinologist tells you to do. But in general, sounds very scary, but all these things are super uh, manageable and preventable with the right tools, with knowledge, with the right team support. So without further ado, I will pass along this presentation um, to my colleagues so that way they can tell you more about heart disease and about eye health. Thank you. Wow, Dr. Pena, thank you. That was an amazing overview. I don't know how you managed to do that in less than 10 minutes. Um, I, uh, as a cardiologist, um, I'm Alan Giddig. I'm the director of cardiology for Mount Sinai Doctors Westchester. And I'm going to talk today about the connection between diabetes and cardiovascular health. Um, and you know, the term cardiovascular health, what we're talking about is the heart, the cardiac organ, as well as the vasculature, the circulation, which Dr. Pena just perfectly, um, laid out as an introduction. So if we can start with the first slide. So when we talk about diabetes and the heart, the main problem that is the most common thing is atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is the buildup of cholesterol plaque in any artery of your body, and it can affect any artery of the body. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about all the different places that can be affected, just so you understand it. And I want to echo something that Dr. Pena said. This should not scare you. It should make you knowledgeable and make you feel empowered to take action because everything we're gonna talk about can be prevented with the right tools and the right support. So here's a picture of a heart. And, and next to it, you see a segment of a normal coronary artery. The coronary arteries are bringing blood flow to the heart. And when it's normal, when you're born, this is what your arteries look like on top. As you develop plaque buildup, if it gets to encroaching on the inside of the artery, that's what the second picture looks like called atherosclerosis. And this is particularly dangerous if it happens in the heart arteries, especially if it clots, then you can develop a heart attack. Okay, the next slide, please. A similar process can happen in the arteries bringing blood flow to your brain. You can develop the same kind of plaque causing narrowings or an acute clot. And this is when we get uh, what we call a stroke or an ischemic stroke to be more precise. Next slide, please. When atherosclerosis affects the arteries of your legs, we call it peripheral artery disease or for short PAD. This is a problem that is particularly more troubling in diabetics because of the things that Dr. Pena spoke about. When you don't feel your feet well, and when you've had chronic high levels of high blood sugar, you can have impairment in the way your tissues heal. So if you develop a wound in your foot, let's say, and the tissue has a hard time healing, if the blood is not flowing well to that area, it's not bringing vital nutrients to, to help the tissue heal and it compounds the problem. And this can be serious, but it can also be prevented with a series of um, lifestyle approaches, as well as doctor follow-ups, some of which Dr. Penny mentioned, and we'll expound on it a little bit later. Next slide, please. So another major cardiovascular complication of diabetes is congestive heart failure. Now this can happen even if the blood flow to the heart muscles is normal. So if you have uncontrolled blood sugar for many years, it can start to affect the way the muscles in your heart walls, the chambers of the heart in the walls there, how they squeeze. So you can first of all have a problem where they become weak or, and the chamber dilates, and that's one form of congestive heart failure. And you can also develop a problem where after squeezing, the heart doesn't relax normally to let blood fill it. And that's a different type of heart failure. And both of these are more common in patients with diabetes. So let's move on to the next slide and talk about why these things are so much more common in diabetic patients. So on the left side of this slide in black, it shows you the, the things that we consider, 
Sorry about that. My screen just timed out. The things that we consider non-modifiable risk factors, we can't change anything about these. Our age, for instance, our gender, our DNA. In the green area are the things that lead to heart disease and vascular disease that we can change. And many of these are common in diabetes. And many of them are things that you may be familiar with, such as high blood pressure, high blood sugar, that is the definition of diabetes, weight gain, obesity, high blood cholesterol. These are things that diabetes itself affects and can worsen if they're there before the diagnosis of diabetes is made. Now I added to the bottom of the slide the word inflammation, and that's a very important concept, um, which we'll come back to. But in essence, inflammation is your immune system thinking that there's a problem that it needs to treat. So when your white blood cells that are circulating through your bloodstream are overactive and they're secreting chemical substances that normally are only supposed to be there when they're trying to kill a bacteria of an infection, but they're doing it during other times, we call that inflammation. It's inappropriate activation of your immune system. And this is a common problem seen in diabetes uh, and we'll talk about why, and it's an important link with many of the complications of the disease. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, when we start to gain weight later in life, many of us put that weight on in our abdominal cavity. We call that abdominal adipose or fat tissue. And the, the fat tissue accumulates in and around the organs, layering over the organs in our belly. This fat tissue is a marked risk factor for heart disease and arterial disease. One of the reasons for it, although it's an area of ongoing research, relates to inflammation. These fat cells secrete many substances that are different from the fat cells in other parts of your body, which are particularly stimulating of inappropriate responses of our immune system. So this is an important connection and one that we can measure on ourselves very simply by either looking at our waist circumference measured with a tape measure or looking at something as simple as our belt loops, okay? And when we start to see that, that this is expanding, we have to get very serious about treating this. Next slide, please. Now, diet. We all know that diet is critical for health. Um, there are many ways that this is true. Um, in diabetes and heart disease, and especially when the two overlap, this is often related to a simple excess of calories that your body can't completely dispose of, especially when those calories come from processed sugar and carbohydrates, processed saturated fats, and very low levels of fiber and of plant-based foods. This combination, which is unfortunately very common in industrialized societies like the US, this combination of dietary intakes leads to very inflamed states and a propensity to store adipose tissue in your belly. And it also is a common reason why people's cholesterol becomes abnormal or their blood pressure becomes abnormal. So nutrition is critical. Next slide, please. Physical activity is extremely important for your health. And this is true for anybody, but especially diabetics. Physical activity has two general components. We call one cardio, which is the movement, okay? Walking, cycling, jumping jacks. And the other we call resistance, which is muscle building. And in this photograph here, you can see people doing both. I like this photo because it's very important. We often do one at the expense of the other. It's critically important because the fitness you develop in your cardiovascular uh, system by doing regular movement activities helps all of your organs function more efficiently. But building muscle is very important because muscles have a very central role in how your body handles blood sugar. And the combination of these things can very much impact the body's propensity to store adipose cells in our belly, and it can lower inflammation, and it can improve a whole host of things in our involuntary nervous system about how our blood pressure and heart rate is controlled. Next slide, please. So mental stress and anxiety is a, an extremely common and often overlooked 
factor in why people develop risk factors for heart disease. When people are under a lot of stress and anxiety, one thing it does is make them less conscious of their health, conscious of going to doctors, uh, meticulous about taking medications, et cetera. But the other things it does is it throws into disarray the involuntary nervous system that I mentioned, which is so critical for controlling our blood pressure and our heart rate, as well as the, the tone, the constriction and dilation of our arteries. It also stimulates our adrenal glands to make cortisol. And cortisol is a very important hormone that can essentially, in one of its actions is to make it harder for the body to him to do what it wants to do with glucose. And so it raises glucose levels. So trying to be step one, mindful of, and step two, proactive about improving mental stress and anxiety can be very helpful to decreasing your risk for cardiovascular disease. And you can sometimes see the results very markedly on the risk factors, such as your abdominal waist circumference, your, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your blood sugar. Next slide, please. Disrupted sleep should really go on the same slide as stress and anxiety because they often go hand in hand. It's um, an extremely difficult thing to treat, but it's very important to talk to your physician and your friends and whoever else in your, in your life has similar problems and try to find resources for it. Because if this is a problem you're facing, it does all of the things in earnest that I mentioned that stress and anxiety can do, including um, causing dysfunction in your autonomic nervous system, as well as your uh, adrenal glands cortisol production. And many studies are now linking disrupted sleep with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, so before quickly touching on the medications, I wanna stress something that Dr. Penny already mentioned in detail, and I cannot say enough how important this is. The Diabetes Alliance at, that Mount Sinai offers to its patients is so critical because you can imagine that your physician has so many things to deal with inside of the visit with you that it's hard to touch on each of these things I just showed you, nutrition and exercise, excuse me, stress and sleep. It's very difficult and to do it well requires a, a, a certain amount of time and personal rapport developed around discussing these things and motivating the patient, you, and coming up with a plan that you feel you can set goals and you want to achieve. This is where our uh, RDCDEs, our health coaches in the Diabetes Alliance can be so helpful to you. And I think it's an extremely unique feature of our program, which, which you should really um, ask your doctors about and seek out. So the last slide, if you move on um, to, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about social bonding and support. I don't wanna shortchange this. This is incredibly important. Um, it's one that you probably have all of the control over and your doctors can do very little to help you with, but this should not be forgotten because this feeling bonded to others versus feeling socially isolated is critically important to your heart health and controlling the risk factors for heart disease, including inflammation. Okay, one more slide, please. So medications. Medications, the lifestyle changes are the bedrock of you creating optimal cardiac health and controlling your diabetes and the consequences. Medications, however, have many pronounced effects that can strongly supplement those changes. And to touch on them briefly, statins, the top line, those are very important medicines that lower cholesterol and have been shown to lower risk of arterial disease like heart attack and stroke. But they also importantly quell the inflammation that enhanced immune system activity in the artery walls. Azetamibe is another medication, which is not a statin, which can work very synergistically to statins and often in people who do have side effects of statins like muscle pains, Azetamide does not cause that, and azetamide has been shown to be very helpful to control cholesterol and to lower disease risk. Angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers are medicines that can help treat blood pressure, but also can improve the kidney function and protect it from detrimental effects of sugar, as well as improve arterial function. There's many different other medicines out there for blood pressure and blood pressure control is very important in diabetics because all of the things that can be going on due to high blood sugar and inflammation that causes the arteries to be unhealthy, all of those things are compounded when there is extra mechanical stress on the walls from high blood pressure. 
And finally, there are multiple medications your doctor can give you to help you control your blood sugar, but several of them deserve specific mention, especially a class called GLP-1 agonists, which includes the medication named Ozempic, and also a class called SGLT2 inhibitors, which includes as one of them, the medication called Jardians. Those medications have been demonstrated not just to improve blood sugar, but to lead to significant lower risks of arterial disease and congestive heart failure. So these are all important things. Your doctors will know about them, but we want to empower you with the knowledge to bring to your doctor visits, to bring up in conversation and to look into on your own to really become an advocate for your own health. Okay, I think that does it. And we should move on to talking about eye health. Thank you guys. That was a great overview. Um, Dr. Giddig, I actually learned a lot from your, your talk as well. Um, and Dr. Pena, thank you so much for setting the stage. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here uh, and see if we can take a look here. So I'm going to presume that everyone can see my screen. Yes. And let's say, play. so my name is Dr. Abnish Delakta. I'm a retina specialist at Mount Sinai, and I take care of a lot of uh, diabetic patients. Um, so I'm very happy to be speaking to you guys about this particular topic. I'm going to focus specifically on diabetic retinopathy, which is something that Dr. Pena mentioned uh, in her introduction um, that can affect people with diabetes. So what's the problem? Of course, you guys know that diabetes can affect the eyes, but most people may not know is that it's the leading cause of blindness in working age adults. Um, and so, you know, it's very important to take care of diabetes because it can really affect people who need to go to work and need to need to do things in their lives that um, that sort of take care of the people around them. Um, one of the things that I like to do whenever I start these conversations is to just discuss sort of how the eye works, um, because sometimes it's a little unclear. Um, so let's just look at a quick cartoon. This is just a cross section of an eye. Um, and normally light goes in from the top there, and it actually progresses down to the back of the eye. And so if we actually look at what's sitting in the back of the eye, we can actually see that there's that thing called the retina, which is very important. And then in the middle of the eye, there's this big jelly ball called vitreous, and it's very clear and it lets light through. When someone like me takes a look at you in the office, what we're doing is we're putting up a lens on your eye and we're actually looking at a photo that looks kind of like this, where that orange stuff over there is the retina. And then you have the vitreous, which is clear kind of in the way. So this is something that we would actually do if you were to come in and see us um, at your eye doctor's appointment. Um, so here's what a normal retina looks like. You can kind of see um, that from the, from the other image. And then what we often do sometimes is take a cross-section and we look at this cross-sectional analysis. And this is what a normal cross-section of that really important part of your retina looks like. It's supposed to look with that divot in the middle. That's a normal retina. So diabetes is obviously, as you just heard from these great doctors, a disease of improper sugar metabolism. And it affects a lot of the body, but in particular, the eye is affected. And most of the people that I see are type two diabetics. Um, but one of the interesting things about this disease is that a lot of people don't actually know they have it. So merely kind of showing up and seeing us is actually already a step forward when it comes to treating this disease and the complications that can come from it. Um, so I just wanna go through just some of the things that can affect your eye especially the retina when it comes to diabetes, because a lot of times it's, it's, it's not exactly obvious. And this isn't meant to scare anyone. It's just to show you what can happen and then kind of show you what you can do to sort of avoid these complications. So the first thing we get is something called diabetic macular edema. That's a mishmash of words. It just means that when you have swelling of the retina. So here's your regular retina that I just showed you, but this is what it actually could look like if you have diabetes that's not under control. So you can see there's a lot of blood spots there and there's a lot of yellow stuff there. And then if we do a cross section of it, just like I showed you before, this is normal, but this is often what a diabetic comes to me with, which is very different. You can tell that it's a little thicker and that it's actually something that doesn't look very normal. This is affecting this particular person's vision. Now, sometimes patients come in and they don't just have what I just showed you, but they have something far worse. So you have this type of a retina that you see, which is normal. And then you have something that looks like this, which has a lot of bleeding around it. And one of the things about the eye that's unique is that we can actually look at your blood vessels as they're coursing through your body without using any various imaging techniques. We can actually look at them directly. And so if it's affecting your eye like this, 
then you can see that, or you can actually probably think that it could potentially affect other blood vessels in your body, as Dr. Pena mentioned initially. So this is something called proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And one of the hopes that we have is to avoid this particular situation. I like to show this from the NEI, which is the National Eye Institute. It's, it shows you on the left how somebody can have normal vision on the left. And then when you look at that same scene with those two kids, this is what somebody with really bad diabetic retinopathy can look uh, can see in, the, in, their, in their view. And one of the issues is that the retina is being affected in that right-sided patient. And the retina is actually an extension of the brain. So it's actually brain tissue. And so if it gets very damaged, it's very hard to fix and you end up having a uh, vision in that way. So the, the, the previous patient basically has something that looks something like this. So you can get even more progression. And I often, I'm, I do surgery, I often have to deal with these types of images where you can't really see what's going on because there's so much scar tissue in the retina that it's actually causing uh, you to not ever even see the structures as they normally would look like. And this patient pretty much can only see my hand move. So the entire purpose of coming and seeing us early, as was suggested by the other two great doctors here, is that we can maybe prevent some of these things from occurring. So how do we treat diabetic retinopathy? Well, I just told you that I do surgery, but we don't really want to get it to that point. There's also other things called laser, um, which is like a special form of light that we use to treat the retina. And it kind of helps with some of the things that you just saw. But one of the things that I actually like to talk about is this thing called eye injections, where, you know, I always say, you know, yes, it's literally injections into the eye, but it's not as scary as you think. Normally, when you get injections of any type, people may not put anesthesia around the area, but we actually do do that around the eye. So it doesn't really, it's not nearly as scary as you think. And it's sort of this situation. Yes, we go into the eye and we tend to inject a medication into the eye that often can actually reduce some of the complications that you you see from diabetes. And so one of the things that I often say is if we can catch it early and get some medicine into your eyes sometimes, even if you have retinopathy, it actually can be reversed in some cases. So we call these intravitreal injections. And I'm sure if some of you have ever had anybody who's, who's had these types of injections, that's what we call them because it's being injected into that jelly ball, which is called vitreous. So, you know, I say all of these things because 90% of uh, people improve uh, with their vision whenever you get these injections. And it's often done once every one to two months. But one thing that I will mention is that, you know, no matter what we talk about, you know, trying to get you from 2200, which is an eye chart, which you guys will be seeing in the, in the clinic with us, but you have an eye chart over here. When we treat you, we can maybe get you down into this area, which is actually pretty good. So we, we, we really, really can help you. But even if we do all of this, the best thing to do, as, as you guys have heard today from two doctors, is systemic blood pressure and sugar control. So the idea is that if we can get that under control, it really solves a lot of these downstream problems. So I go into two take-home points that you guys can do to avoid all of the things that we just talked about. The first, of course, I use this line, God helps those who help themselves. And I don't know who actually said it. It's literally attributed to everyone in history. But the way I use it for this is to focus on controlling your hemoglobin A1C, which is that blood sugar metric as intensely as possible. So one of the reasons why is because some studies have shown that if you decrease your A1C by 1%, it can lead to a 35% decrease in retinopathy complications. It's, it's a huge deal. So as an example, say you go from an 11 to a seven. And these are numbers that you may or may not have heard of. But if you go from an 11 to a seven, well, congratulations. You're now less than one fifth as likely to have complications from retinopathy as you were before you started your control. And what does that mean in plain English? You've reduced your chances of complications from retinopathy by over 80%. And that's not even including the eye doctor. So this is very important. But not only that, as has been uh, told to you by Drs. Gittig and Pena just now, it does all these other great things too. It reduces your chance of having kidney damage, nerve damage, risk of heart attack, and risk of dying of any cause. So just you controlling it, sort of helping yourself in a way, is really, really helpful for all of these other downstream effects that can occur. So I always say the point one is diet, exercise, take, and take your medications as prescribed to achieve intense blood sugar control as best as you can make it, because that's really, really going to help you. Now, the second point is this line that says showing up is 80% of life. This is, uh, this is a quote. So here's the way I interpret it as, see your eye doctor and I say, please, because here's a stat. 
half, about half of those with diabetes don't actually accomplish getting to their eye doctor. Now, with the Diabetes Alliance at Mount Sinai, they do a tremendous job in connecting you with eye doctors. But this is one of the most important things. And why do we say that? Because early detection and treatment can reduce vision loss by 98%. 98% is a massive number. So I do this kind of uh, statement again. So say you have diabetes and you go to your eye doctor. Well, congratulations. You now have a 98% reduced chance of having vision loss. That's literally the one major thing that you can do. And I sort of go through this for people with type two diabetes. You know, when you're first diagnosed, you should come and see an ophthalmologist because it's really important to get your eye checked to see if you have any changes that need to be treated. And then afterwards, you need to repeat this annually, whether you have type one or type two, even if you don't have retinopathy. So I say this again, very, very strongly, even if you don't have retinopathy, but you do have diabetes, you really should be seen every year by an eye doctor so we can make sure that everything is going just fine. So see your eye doctor, please. I rephrase this as saying showing up to your eye doctor is 98% of reductions in blindness from diabetes, because that is something that you really can do. So, uh, and that's me. Uh, so with that, I will turn it back over to my esteemed colleagues here. But like I said, you know, if you do have diabetes, don't fret, just come and see one of us. And, and the Diabetes Alliance does definitely uh, get you caught up with that.